And joining us now here in studio, the 24th Premier of the Province of Ontario and the MPP for Ottawa South, there's Dalton McGinty. Premier, welcome. Steve, it's always good to be back. No, it's a pleasure to have you in because I know you tend to make this one of your very early stops in the last couple of election campaigns and we're grateful for that. So, let's start with this. Something you know well. No Ontario Premier in 52 years has won three consecutive majority governments. So why should Ontarians give you a third term as Premier? Well, it's an interesting historical fact, but I think at the end of the day it's what motivates you deep down inside. And as far as I'm concerned, Steve, we've done a lot of great things, made a lot of progress. But the job's half done. I want to deliver now fully on full day kindergarten. I want to exploit every possible opportunity when it comes to building a strong, clean energy sector in Ontario. I want to make sure that every single young person in Ontario, regardless of their family background or incomes, got access to the best possible post-secondary education. I want to do more for seniors. I want to do more to ensure that they can stay in their homes and grow older safely and, and getting the best possible health care there. If the job's only half done, so you're going to run for two more terms then, is that right? <laughs> if I got my math right? I'm only being half facetious yeah. here. Most leaders, I, I, I must confess, I'm very fascinated by this decision to go again because, of course, most leaders, if they're lucky enough to get back-to-back -back majority governments, they say, thank you, and now I'll go on and do something else. Mm -hmm. At what point did you consider, that's not for me, I'm going again? Uh, probably, you know, 18 months to two years ago. And uh, it became a very um, uh, kind of heart-to-heart -heart conversation that I had with my wife, Terry. And uh, um, I'm cursed uh, or blessed, depending on how you look at it, with a, uh, a strong sense of responsibility. And uh, these are uncertain economic times. Uh, if you take a look at the global economy, it's challenging times for our families. That news, news about that uncertainty pours into our homes tweet by tweet. We used to say daily, we used to say hourly, now it's instantaneously. Uh, and w there's a lot of great things that we have done and, and lots more that we can and I feel that we should do. I've asked Ontarians to do some difficult things. I take responsibility for that. But I also take responsibility for moving, moving this province forward, helping families, helping us ensure that we, we've got that certainty in our lives that's been lacking. Certainty that comes from knowing that schools are getting better, healthcare is getting better, the economy is getting stronger. We're exploiting new opportunities in the global economy. It's a gutsy move, I, I, I can say, because you know it has been half a century since anybody did what you are trying to do. You mentioned you talked to your wife. Did you talk to anybody else in terms of getting well, advice on whether to do well, this? Well, you know, there's, that's, that's kind of the personal dimension to it. But then there are young moms who talk to me and say, you're not going to walk away from full day kindergarten, right? No, but you your successor that, could bring that in. Yeah, no, no, yeah. But you, you brought that forward. You're not going to walk away from that, right? And I, I'm not going to let them down. Um, there are the uh, uh, tens of thousands of people who've now got a job in the green energy sector. And I've met with some of those folks uh, in the manu in manufacturing centers. And they say to me, you're not going to walk away from this, right? We can't count on the other guys to keep driving this. And I said, don't worry, I, I won't let you down. So there's a sense of when you um, apply yourself, when you engage, when you invest yourself, in, in better public services and an exciting new economic opportunity, Steve, it's not an easy thing to walk away. There are obviously other things that, that, that might attract you, but I feel a strong sense of responsibility. And these are the best of times, right? This isn't, you know, the, you know, the, the early 80s or the, or I guess the late 80s would be even better. Um, it's a time of uncertainty. I feel a sense of responsibility to to help us continue to move forward. You're going to forgive me trying to get inside your head here a little bit because yeah. I am interested in this and, and that is I, I presume at some point you had to look down at your cabinet or your backbench and you had to make the calculation that you know what either I can lead this team to a third consecutive majority or one of them can do it and as I look at them I think I'm actually better to do it than they are. Did you make that calculation? No. Uh, that's not the way I saw it. I've got lots of bench strength. I think I've been blessed more so than probably any other Ontario Premier in terms of capable, committed, hardworking, successful public servants. At the end of the day, you've got to ask yourself, do you want this? With all its wonderful privileges and opportunities that it creates for you and all of the challenges and the, uh, the public uh, you know, uh, accountability that's char that characterizes leadership at the beginning of the, of the 21st century. And do I still want to do it? Yes, I do. Do I think I can still do more for the people of Ontario? Absolutely. 
Tony Blair, did you re read his autobiography I sure by did. chance? You yep. did. Uh, he said there was a. I thought of you actually when I read this line in it. He said, You, you got to get out of public life before people stop listening to you. And for him, I mean, he did get three terms. Can you tell whether people are still listening to you? Yes, uh, you can. Uh, you can. You can. And it's, this is not just a function of, of the science, the data collection, and the polling. I speak to people by the thousands. And people can become fairly good judges of, of speakers. And speakers can become fairly good judges of audiences through body language, uh, their sense of engagement, their receptivity, their desire to listen, to learn a bit, and of course to follow. And I still have a strong sense that while I have asked Ontarians to do some tough things, there is, if not a warm embrace, an acceptance that uh, this guy's heart's in the right place, he's doing these things for the right reasons, and the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, there is measurable progress, whether you're talking test scores, graduation rates, wait times, access to doctors, economic growth, measurable, solid improvement. Well, you smiled when you said it, because you know you've looked at the polls too, you know you're the second most unpopular premier in the country, and even in your ads, your most recent ad, you come out and you say, look it, I know I'm not Mr. Popularity. Um, do you but you know you can't you can't just run on the basis of of how you think you're going to be perceived in in, in any immediate sense well when you're running for re-election right? it's good to be popular it's good it doesn't hurt it doesn't <laughs> hurt <laughs> but it's also um, it's you know I have a tremendous confidence in Ontarians and their desire to bring a thoughtful approach to to um, um, judgment when it comes to comparing the three options before them and I think they're going to take a look at the big picture not just my tax initiatives, but also our achievements in schools, healthcare, economic growth, and the like. Well, okay. Let's. In the best of all possible worlds, I guess you would suggest that the people take a good, logical, thoughtful look at the four platforms. I'll say because the Greens would want to be in that as well, and all the right others there. as well that are out there, mm -hmm. and and make a decision. Right. Um, and you were very much on fire this morning at your event in Markham, where you said the Conservative Party has turned into a tea party. They've become, I think you said, resentful and bitter and angry and mean, and they don't represent Ontario values. But the people in this city were in the mood for a tea party last October when they voted for mayor. How concerned are you that people are in the mood for a tea party right now? And if they are, that's not you. Well, you know, uh, people are going to do what they're going to do. Um, and my responsibility as a leader, at least this is my understanding of leadership, is to find ways to appeal to our best. My responsibility is to be you on your best day. On our worst days, we can be selfish and shallow and short-sighted and, at our, and our, at our worst, mean-spirited. On our best days, we're kind, caring, considerate, thoughtful, responsible, determined, resolute, and successful. That's what I'm supposed to reflect of Ontarians every day. But you're all running we, negative ads, we, which, which suggests there are some bad times ahead. We, we, may not ex, we may not express that at all times because of who we are as human beings. But I believe, and one of the reasons, important reasons I got into this line of work and stay in this line of work is that people, I think there's a fundamental yearning. We long to be a little bit bigger and better than ourselves. We long to do something of lasting value. We yearn to do something good for the next generation and the one after that. And that's a tough thing to kind of to give expression to every single day. But the fact of the matter is, we're always at our best when we work together. Does that suggest if you lose that we were probably in a small-minded, less generous point of view? People are never wrong. When it comes to these big decisions, they're never wrong. And I'll accept whatever outcome they uh, determine is, is fitting. But I will work as hard as I can between now and Election Day to convince them we've done a lot of great things together and we need to keep going together. Uh, the history nerd in me is going to ask you another question here. Do you remember what happened 21 years ago today? You bet, I was there. <laughs> Not now, today. Was today the actual election day? Yes. Yeah, well, I remember that then, yeah, very well. <laughs> uh, for those who don't remember, it was a disaster for your party, but you were the one new MPP elected for the Liberals on September 6th, uh, 1990. 21 years ago. I raise it because some people may not know that you've actually been around this province mm -hmm. at Queen's Park for a hell of a long time, leader since 96, premier since 03, and they may be asking themselves, 
has this guy got any gas left in the tank? There's yeah. this a long time to be around. Yeah. How would you prove to people that you're still on the job? Well, take a look at the platform. Take a look at our plan. Uh, this, is not, this is hardly a case of resting on our laurels, whatever those might be. We, the plan is ambitious and it's bold. It's the single biggest investment in post-secondary education in terms of uh, making tuition affordable for families. We're going to redesign and reform health care so it, it's going to help us cope with a real challenge, which is an, an aging demographic. Uh, and we're pursuing, uh, with zeal and aggressivity, uh, clean, a clean energy economy. So, you know, we're the, we're, you know, they've told us that our schools now, Steve, are the best in the English-speaking world. They're telling us that our, in our health care, We've got the say, who's they and, and uh, McKinsey, what they McKinsey International, right? Are saying we have the best schools when best measured school by best system. They took a look at the uh, fastest um, the schools that are improving the fastest in the world. They put a, an independent report uh, and said that uh, we're the best. Of course, there's the program for international students, the PISA, the PISA results mm -hmm. that show us that we've cracked the top ten when it comes to our health care. I mean, these are achievements. The point I'm making: these are achievements that we, that, you know, that we're making not because we because I've been quietly presiding over the evolution of government at the beginning of the 21st century is because I'm, a, I'm an activist and I've been driving change in our schools and health care. We didn't even measure wait times in Ontario before. Mm -hmm. Now we measure them and we've got, the, we've got the shortest time. We had nine wind turbines when I got the job. We've got hundreds up around the province now. Not everyone's happy about Not that. Not everyone's happy about that. But you know yeah. what? That's, that's, that's picking a lane. It's saying, folks, you know, we, we, you know I'd, I'd love to be able to say that uh, we don't have to put up any more gas plants or build, uh, you know, we don't have to replace nuclear and, uh, and we can all conserve it. Th that's not reality. We've got, to, we've got to come up with some way to generate new electricity. And I prefer to do it in a way that's clean and that creates jobs here in Ontario for our people. I, I want to get into the tax discussion with you, but I don't want to get into the typical kind of, you know, talking points where I ask, are you going to raise taxes? And you say no. And then, you know, I say, well, but you said that the last, anyway, I'm going to try and find a different way around this. And that is, are we in a day and age where it's impossible for a politician to say to people, look, I know I promised I wasn't going to raise your taxes, but circumstances changed. And so when the circumstances changed, so do my policies. Can you, because I don't think you've really said that. Can you say that if that's in fact the case? Well, you know, you're, you're, you're that's a, a little bit abstract, uh, and um, if I might, I want to I want to nail it down to a to the bedrock of Ontario political reality. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, back in 2003, uh, the PCs uh, left a hidden 5.6 billion dollar deficit. I had a mandate to invest in and dramatically improve public services, including health care. So I had a couple of choices. One was to uh, make cuts to public services, which were already suffering badly, or to improve them. I made a choice. I stand by that choice. And I would say to uh, observers that we've made dramatic improvement in our health care system today. And then, uh, because of the HST, Steve, we now have stabilized our economy. We have strengthened its underpinnings, its foundation. We are more competitive. We're creating more jobs than the rest of Canada combined since January. And we've now, as a result of those difficult decisions and sometimes unpopular decisions, we've now put ourselves into a position where we can lend more and more support to families. But we started by cutting uh, the price of electricity, 10%. We started by cutting income taxes, $355 for the average family. And now going forward, we can do even more for families, I'm cutting even... tuition, uh, and uh, helping seniors stay in their home. I'm giving you a chance to get all that out because I want to come good. back at you with. My suspicion is that people think you've got a good story to tell on things like health and education. My other suspicion is I'm not sure you've sold, sold them on your trustworthiness on the issue of taxes because you have raised taxes twice when you said you wouldn't. Do you have a credibility gap on taxes? Well, you know what? Um, being premium means you've, you've got to make calls on a daily basis. Uh, and every four years, voters get to make a call on what I've been doing. So I'll be asking voters to take into account what I've done on taxes. I'm not asking them to pretend that it did not happen. But I'll also be asking them to look at the big picture. What has happened to our schools? What's happened to our health care? 
what's happened to our economy? What's happened to our clean energy future? How much closer it is to us now in Ontario as a result of the steps that we've taken together? What's happened to the province generally? I like to think that quite apart from, the, from distinct policies and programs and economic growth, there is a stronger sense that we are in this together in this province, that we are still the most powerful driver of growth in the country. I've always felt that we've been commissioned by history to lead. We don't enjoy any options in this regard. I like to think that Ontarians are a bit more plugged in to what it means to be an Ontarian, a bit more proud of the, of the great work that we've been doing together. I want to just get a sense in our last five minutes here about as you mentioned earlier, you've led a very activist government, and you have. You've kind of told people where they can and can't smoke and where they can and can't use their cell phone and you know, what kind of dog they can buy and what kind of drinks they can have in their school vending machines. You, you have been, or let me ask the question, are you concerned you've been a little too in their face? No. Well, let me, let's take, take a particular example here. Um, driving while using your cell phone, uh, that was seen to be controversial interventionist, um, um, overly activist. Well, we've adopted that law here in Ontario. Uh, it's since been emulated in many other states and provinces uh, on the continent. Uh, and, and here's the question I'd ask, uh, you know, uh, people, ask of people, do you think it makes sense for us, if you're at the wheel, at the same time that you're driving and dealing with distractions that are on the road, and trying to be as attentive as possible. Do you think it makes sense for us to be distracted at the same time with a piece of technology that's calling upon our attention elsewhere? I think most folks would say, it doesn't really make sense, and it is safer for us to do that. So I, I guess what I did in that circumstance, and the same thing with uh, uh, pit bulls, one of the best advice that we had was that these are dangerous animals. Um, they've been bred to fight, if we'd listen to the best advice that we had from doctors and other experts, is, you know, I was trying to, and I will always try to give expression to what our best instincts are on these things. Okay, those are smaller, more yep. micro issues. Let me open it up to the bigger issues. Uh, it has been your belief, I think, it's fair to say, that in order to attract the best jobs to this province, you are prepared to lay out some pretty significant government subsidies, investments, call them what you will. Uh, $250 million to get a video game manufacturer here, uh, $48 million for Magna the other day to... Um, spur on infrastructure for electric cars. Would we get those jobs if we didn't offer those subsidies? No, we wouldn't. Are you sure about that? Positive. How do you know? Uh, because um, I like to think I have a pretty good understanding of how competition works in the global economy. And the most successful jurisdictions have, are characterized by a few things. Number one, they invest heavily in the skills uh, and educational levels of their people. Number two, they drive hard on the innovation file so that they, they, they're looking for ways to constantly reinvent themselves into prosperity, always looking for what's next. The other thing is that, and this was a great lesson I learned growing up in a big family, you're always at your best together. Always. So, so governments, um, uh, you know, if you take a look at China, for example, right? this is not a, a, a government that just quietly removes itself from the day-to-day -day activities mm -hmm. of business. Every once in a while, it puts its considerable muscle behind an effort. China's a little bit different, right, in terms of its political system. But you take a look at Germany, for example. If you take a look at a number of U.S. states, you don't even have to go that far. It's one thing for the private sector to do its shtick in the global economy mm -hmm. and to be supported in that with a capable workforce. But if you get the private sector and a capable workforce and a government in sync, well, now you're talking an unbeatable combination. And then all you've got to do is pick a lane. You can't be the best at everything. So, for example, we've decided in Ontario that notwithstanding the uncertainty that prevails in the global economy, there are two couple of things of which we are absolutely certain. One is the price of oil and gas, Steve, it's only going one way, and that's up. And there's something we, knew about, we know about technologies in general and renewable energy technologies in specific. They're coming down. Flat screen TVs came down in price. Cell phones came down in price. Renewable technologies are coming down in price. We want to be at the head of that curve. What we've done for auto in Ontario, we're the number one producer in North America, I want us to become the number one producer of renewable technologies in North America. At some point in time, American moms and dads are going to say, we've got to stop burning coal. It's not good for our kids' health. There's got to be a better way. 
And we want to say, you know the folks up north who make all those great cars for you? We're really good at making renewable technologies. So let us produce those for you, and let's create jobs here for ourselves. Premier, as always, good of you to join us here at TVO. And as I will say to all the candidates, uh, good luck out there on the hustings. Thanks a million, Steve. Always a pleasure. Don't McGinty, Premier of Ontario.